Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns for sale in their upcoming February 2015 regional auction. And I found one lot in the catalog that was a pair of really kind of interesting early self-loading commercial hunting rifles from the U.S. Now, at the, the turn of the century, beginning of the 1900s, there were two uh, very common, very popular, and very successful self-loading rifles on the market. One was the Winchester and one was the Remington. Uh, Remington had the Model 8. It was designed by John Browning. It was a long recoil um, operated mechanism. Extremely good guns. Uh, they sold for many decades. Uh, Remington's product was, they actually had a couple. They had the 1905 and the Model 1907 self-loaders. Those were basically large blowback uh, cartridges in the 35 and 351 Remington and then slightly later the 451 uh, I'm sorry, not Remington, Winchester, self-loading. Those were also very, very common. Um, a little less sophisticated, a little simpler, also very popular. The third option at the time was the Standard Arms Model G. These were uh, patented in 1906 by their inventor, Morris Smith. They went into production about 1909, and they were for sale in 1910. They are actually a third different type of mechanism. They are a long-stroke gas piston uh, design. What makes them kind of interesting is that they were all made uh, to be either manually or semi-automatically operated. So you could use the long stroke gas piston or you could use the pump handle as a manually, uh, manually operated pump action rifle. So about 12,000 of these rifles were made in total over about 10 years. Unfortunately, they had some very serious problems, um, mainly the linkage between the bolt and the gas piston had one overly weak pin that had a lot of stress placed on it. The, the seems to be the most common failure mode for these rifles was for that pin to bend or shear. And when that happened, it was extremely difficult and laborious to, to disassemble and fix the gun. Uh, that made them less than popular. Uh, the Winchester and the Remington self-loading commercial uh, sporting arms didn't have that problem. They were both very good designs. Standard Arms was innovative and mechanically interesting and not not badly made, uh, but not quite well enough designed to stand the rigors of, of a lot of use. And that ultimately killed them in the market. So why don't we bring the camera in a little closer and take a look at how these work. We'll pull the, the grip assembly off one so we can see the internals. And uh, yeah, check out the third and unknown early American sporting semi-auto. So beginning out at the muzzle end, we have the gas block right here. This uh, taps gas out of the barrel into a gas tube here. There is a square uh, adjustment bolt here that will allow you to disable the gas port to block it. That would allow you to use the rifle only in manually operated mode instead. This requires a tool to change, so I won't demonstrate that. You can see it is marked on, so we're currently in semi-auto mode. Now there's a, a tube with a recoil spring down here. Our gas piston comes back. It connects back to a pair of recoil plates or sliding plates in the side of the receiver, which are connected to the bolt. So gas from the tube comes down here, pushes the bolt back. And a recoil spring in here, which you can just barely see through that hole, is what uh, provides the force to pull the bolt back into battery after firing. Now, you see this, there is this very fancy um, brass handle for the pump. This was standard on all models of the Model G. All the different variants, no matter how fancy or plain, all had this relief uh, in the, the pump handle. Very fancy, frankly, kind of unusual. And originally, this would have been what's called Japaned, had a, a glossy black finish to it that unfortunately wears off very quickly. So you can see just some little remnants of it in the, the crevices of this embossing. Anyway, the button down here allows us to engage the pump handle. So if you want to manually open the gun, you would push this button and then cycle the pump. We have a button down here under the magazine. I push that and pull it back. It pops open the floor plate. This is how you would actually load the gun. Believe it or not, you open it up. We have our spring-loaded follower arm here. Put your cartridges in while the gun's upside down and then close the magazine floor plate. 
we have a button here. This is our safety. Back is safe. That locks the bolt, uh, so it cannot be manually pumped, and it also locks the trigger. It doesn't do anything. That is the fire position. And then this little button is our manual bolt hold, hold open. You can use the pump handle to draw the bolt all the way to the rear, push in this button to lock it in place. That is, should be, all of the controls on the Model G. Of course, have a buckhorn rear sight and a fairly typical front sight on it. Now, the way we disassemble this uses this hole in the back of the receiver. You can see in there, there's a little detent inside. That is a little spring-loaded piece. I'm going to use a fancy disassembly tool in there. We just depress, there's a spring-loaded catch inside, push that in, and then pull. There we go. So what I was pushing on there was actually this. You can see that moving. When that catch comes down like that, it allows the bottom half of the gun to come off. So, looking in the, the firing fire control group here, we can see that the standard arms is a striker-fired rifle. When I pull the trigger, it drops this sear, which allows the striker to go forward, fire the cartridge in the chamber. Pretty simple, that's about all there is in here. This is our follower, which we saw earlier from the underside. And the magazine again. The follower comes out. That's our magazine well. The feedlets are machined into the top of this assembly. There is no detachable magazine in there. So that's the bottom half of the gun. Actually pretty simple and remarkably modern. Now the upper half of the gun is where we have the bolt. You can see a little bit of a hump in the receiver here. This is where the locking shoulder is. This operates with a tilting bolt, so the bolt locks into a recess right here that acts as a locking shoulder. You can see the striker spring in the bolt right there. Let me zoom in on that. All right, so right here, this is our striker up front and our striker spring. There are two kind of funky cone-shaped springs at the back of the bolt. Those are simply buffer springs so that when the bolt hits the back of the receiver here, uh, it doesn't peen it. It's got something to, uh, to absorb that impact. Now, in order to cycle the bolt back, I'm going to depress this button and pull the slide back. This has a pretty stiff recoil spring to it, so a little tricky to do. So right here, the bolt has dropped down into its locking recess. As I pull back, it's going to pop up right there and then move backwards. And it would do this, it would cycle all the way back. The little conical buffer springs hit the back of the receiver there. The case is ejected upward through that ejection port. And then under spring pressure, the bolt comes back forward, chambers a new cartridge. We can see it drop into the locking recess right there. There it opens. You can see the extractor right there at the top. Comes all the way back. Uh, I can also point out while we're in here. You can see the hole in the side plate right there. That is what uses, was used in conjunction with this button to manually hold the bolt open. So I slide it all the way back so that hole lines up with this button, push the button in, that locks the bolt in place. Then when I want to close it, all I have to do is pull back slightly, spring pressure on this button pops it open, and away we go. After the problems with the Model G, with its unreliability and its, its fragility, really came to light. Standard Arms obviously had a problem. And the biggest way that they went about trying to deal with that was to redesign the rifle to be manually operated only, which takes the, uh, the pressure off of the, the weak components in the recoil system. Uh, they called that version the Model M, and it used a 
as many as possible of the same parts. Uh, looks very similar, but is pump action only. That didn't save them. Those were still quite unpopular. It was hard to recover from the, the bad publicity of the early semi-auto guns not working well. Um, Caliber-wise, these were available in four different calibers. The 25, the 30, 32, and 35 caliber Remington. Those are the same calibers that the Remington Model 8 was available in. They are quite good cartridges. They're for, for the period, for the early 1900s, they're remarkably powerful cartridges for a self-loading rifle, uh, which didn't help standard arms. But uh, had the guns worked, those would have made them quite popular, I expect. So this particular rifle is missing its butt plate. However, the other rifle in the lot is not. You can see these have a very fancy, again, embossed brass butt plate. That was also standard on all the guns, regardless of, of grade. Something you definitely don't see anymore today. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, not many people are very familiar with these guns, although there are a decent number of them out there still. Uh, some broken and some working. If you're interested in adding these two to your own personal collection, they are for sale here at Rock Island. So if you take a look in the description below, you'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page where you can take a look at their high-res photos, create an account, and bid online if you're interested. Thanks for watching.